This is U.S. History 1, uh, PowerPoint Lecture 1.3 on the Prelude to the American Revolution. Uh, and the general trend that we're going to look at here uh, is one that we've mentioned before. Uh, England is going to progressively uh, attempt to exert greater control over the colonies. Prior to really the English Civil War, uh, virtually no attempt was made to exert any kind of control over the colonies. The one exception being the establishment of the Royal Crown Colony of Virginia, which we've talked about before after the uh, Second Powhatan War, when the Jamestown Company, which was a commercial venture, uh, goes into bankruptcy. Well, that's going to change after the English Civil War. Now, just a little bit of background on the English Civil War. Uh, the English Civil War was fought uh, between Parliament and the King. And oftentimes, history uh, has a tendency to over-emphasize uh, 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 religious connotations. As it works out, consequentially, Parliament represented largely the Protestant faction, and at the time it was the Stuart monarchy, and the Stuarts were Catholics. But that's kind of really a sideshow. What 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 the overarching uh, 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 problem was, and and I'll I'll just relate this to you by saying that uh, when I was an undergraduate in college. It was the first time that I really came into contact with the works of Karl Marx. And Marx makes an argument that the driving force of world history uh, is relationship to the means of production, economics. And I objected to this greatly when I first learned of it. Uh, but as time has gone on in the intervening 30 years, I've come to accept that Marx's argument in large part is correct. That, that, that economics is one of the primary factors driving world history. And sure enough, it's true here in the English Civil War, because Parliament also represented the burgeoning middle class, the bourgeois in England, which had started to take hold really in the 16th century. Um, and so it's, it's coincidental that it happens to be Protestant. Uh, in the war, the Stuart monarchy will be driven from the throne, Parliament will win, and rising to the top will be a, a, a very uh, a colorful fellow by the name of Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell is a Puritan. We've talked about the Puritans. The Puritans were the ones that founded the Plymouth Colony. Okay, so Cromwell is going to dramatically reorganize both the administration of government and the Anglican Church. Uh, and for all of his weaknesses, Cromwell was, by every stretch, a very severe ruler, but for all of his inconveniences, he was a brilliant tactician. What Cromwell spent, Cromwell will, will run England from roughly 48 until 1660 in the Stuart Restoration. Uh, and this is not by any means, of course, on English history, but we need to men make mention of that. Uh, that Cromwell will be overthrown because he really doesn't have a successor to himself. Uh, and the Stuart monarchy will be restored and it will stay in the 1660s and 70s and we'll look at the difficulties that that has with the American colonies because it's James II that's going to begin to try to exert real control over the English colonies. For Cromwell's part, he'll pass the Navigation Acts. But Cromwell spends most of his rule, most of his time, conquering Ireland or reconquering Ireland, I guess, is the better way to say it. Uh, and if you're, a, if you're a student of military history, uh, study the campaigns of Oliver Cromwell in Ireland. Uh, Cromwell was an absolutely brilliant tactician in 17th century warfare. 17th century warfare largely had to do with the siege and siege uh, operations uh, because you had large fortified areas uh, and and offensive technology had not caught up to that and so the, the, the siege was a very difficult undertaking and Cromwell's sieges of the strongholds in Ireland is an absolutely brilliant exercise in siege tactics. Um, but at any rate, he's the one that will pass the Navigation Acts. Now, the thing we want to remember about the Navigation Acts, which were passed in 1651, and we'll deal with those in just a second, is that until the 1690s, until the Glorious Revolution and William uh, of Orange takes over, uh, the Navigation Acts are really not terribly enforced, okay? Because... Coming out of the English Civil War and with the internal political strife in England through the 1660s and 70s, they have very little capacity to project 
sufficient force to enforce the Navigation Acts in the colonies. That's all going to change when William takes over. He'll institute what's called the Admiralty Courts, uh, and the Navigation Acts will begin to uh, have some teeth behind them. He'll pass a series of uh, extra Navigation Acts with, with some actual teeth behind them that will be enforced. The early reorganizations, and we've talked about one of them, politically the establishment of the Royal Crown Colony in Virginia, and we've also talked about the economics uh, in terms of the Navigation Acts, which were never strictly enforced. I just mentioned the Courts of Admiralty. Uh, the Navigation Acts will be extended and will be enforced, and this is the beginning of really problems with the colonies, okay? Because the Navigation Acts were never really enforced, the, their effect wasn't really felt in the colonies, but once they start to get enforced in the 1690s, really, uh, then the Americans are going to be forced to, to uh, uh, adjust accordingly. And one of the adjustments they'll make is that one of the large trades, particularly in New England, uh, that will come up, one of the main occupations that will come up, is smuggling. For example, one of, the, one of our famous... Patriots uh, is a smuggler, John Hancock. John Han that's how John Hancock will make his money. That's how he'll make his living, is Hancock will become a smuggler, and it will become one of the precipitatory causes, both of the Revolution and more specifically of Lexington and Concord. One of the objectives in, in the march on Lexington and Concord for the British was to capture both John Hancock and Sam Adams, who we'll deal with in a minute. Sam Adams organizes a group known as the Sons of Liberty. Uh, but Hancock is a wanted criminal for smuggling. The most obvious attempt to uh, gain control over the colonies, and it, it is at least partially drawn with what I was just talking about, the rise in smuggling uh, that takes place and the objection to the Navigation Acts, will be the establishment of the Dominion of New England. Uh, it will be uh, a grouping of the New England colonies together. The Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Plymouth Colony and Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire will all cease to exist under this. James will organize them <coughs> as the Dominion of New England. Uh, and when he does so, he'll assign uh, Edmund Andros uh, as the governor. There will be no state assembly. Um, and in the first American Revolution, in, 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 a, in, a, in a kind of a interesting coincidence, in 1688, James II will be overthrown in England. He will escape to France, and as I mentioned in the previous lecture on 1.2, this will be a, a, by, um, certainly one of the lesser causes, but Louis XIV will give James II safe haven in France. Uh, well, simultaneously with that, and without any coordination, there's no communication between the two, uh, the colonists in the Dominion of New England will overthrow Governor Andros, okay? At which point, uh, a kind of anarchy breaks out in the New England colonies, which ultimately will lead to the Salem Witch Trials, uh, a, a series of ad hoc assemblies, and because of what England had gone through with religious toleration, the Dominion of New England instituted that, much to the objection, and one of the reasons for the overthrow of Andros, much to the objection of many of the American colonists, particularly in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and what previously was the Plymouth Colony. Uh, and so they will literally go on a witch hunt, quite literally, um, so that anyone who objects to the Puritan Church or the Anglican Church uh, will be accused of witchcraft. In all, they will in fact hang, uh, not burn, but hang 19 people accused of witchcraft uh, pri before England will reestablish authority. Now, when English England reestablishes authority, which is only a couple of years later, uh, under, under William of Orange, they will restore the colonies to their own assemblies, but the Massachusetts Bay Colony as such and the Plymouth Colony as such cease to exist. It will now be the colony of Massachusetts. Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Hampshire will be reestablished, and Plymouth will be 
un will be gone altogether. Plymouth will be subsumed partially under Massachusetts and partially under New Hampshire, which is why we don't have a state known as Plymouth today. Is it, This is when it disappears. Um, okay. A little background on the Glorious Revolution, because it's going to be, be of pivotal importance to the Americas. In 1688, James is overthrown. Now, James is overthrown for a, a number of reasons, okay? And it, it can get fairly colorful. The Stuarts had a tendency, in order to preserve their line, the Stuarts had a tendency to inbreed, and James II was the product of this. James II was a drooling idiot. Uh, he, was, he was mentally unbalanced. Okay, and which which explains a lot of the severity that takes place under James the Second. And remember, James the Second is the one that subsumes under his own personal ownership uh, the previously Dutch colonies of New Amsterdam, which become New Jersey and New York. Okay, well, as a result of his excesses, James is overthrown. He escapes to France. Parliament sends uh, a letter to Holland. Uh, and William is, at the time, living in Holland in exile, okay, uh, because James II has put a price on his head. They will send a letter to him to come back uh, and take over. At the same time, the Earl of Shaftesbury writes to his friend, also in exile uh, in Holland, along with William, uh, a fellow by the name of John Locke, who I've mentioned before, and he quite literally commissions Locke to write a treatise on government that will once and for all put an end to the internal strife that the English government has been having, that will once and for all determine the final sovereignty and the balance between the king and parliament. John Locke will do this very successfully with the writing and later publication in 1689 of the Second Treatise on Civil Government, okay, in which he will, in which he, he advocates, uh, and this is, this is I, I mentioned this before, that among other things, what the Second Treatise on Civil Government, and I heartily encourage you uh, to, to read the Second Treatise on Civil Government, I warn you, though, that it's a bit of a slog. It's 17th century English, which can, can be a, a certain slog. In fact, it reminds me of something uh, at the, uh, let's see, what was the name of it? Harrison. Harrison Hall was, was the political science building at, my, at graduate school at Miami University. And on the door, just outside the door, there was a plaque, which was a quote from John Locke. And I read it one time, and it's not important what it was, but it was a sentence. It was one single sentence that was 127 words long. This was very typical of 17th century English. Uh, and actually, I kind of borrowed it myself. I was working on a group. This is back in Miami University now that I'm thinking about it. I was working on a on a project with a friend of mine by, by the name of Dylan Armstrong. And the way we would work on the project is I would write something and then take a break, and she would come in and write her piece, and I would come in and write my piece. And after I wrote my piece, she sat down at the computer, and she said, Jay, are, are, are you aware of the fact that this last sentence that you wrote has 107 words in it? And I said, yeah, what's wrong with that? As long as it's grammatically correct, that's fine. Uh, and uh, early in the in the twentieth century, it's kind of interesting. There was a in the sixties, there was a uh, an essay published. I can't remember by who, but it, it was entitled "Why Johnny Can't Read." Uh, at the turn of the nineteenth century to the twentieth century, the average word of the English sentence was twenty-eight words. Now it's six. You know. People just, I guess, can't pay attention to a sentence that long. But at any rate, that's John Locke. Uh, that's his, his writing. But among other things, he will create the three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. And for Locke, the dominant branch should be the, ju the, the legislative branch. Now, it's not surprising that he's really, you know, he's been commissioned by a member of parliament to write this. So that, that shouldn't surprise us. But his argument behind it is because the, the legislative branch most encapsulates and represents the majority, okay, the general will of the people, and so it should be dominant. Uh, and it is the first and foremost triumph of contract theory. It's going to be the first application, formally, of contract theory. Uh, England will adopt it. And the interesting thing, which is going to to kind of 
be of relevance to us later on when the American Revolution happens is at the end of the Second Treatise on Civil Government. Now, it's actually kind of interesting uh, on a legalistic uh, uh, context how this works. Later on in the, in the Second Treatise, he says, okay, you have a contract between the government and the governed. If the government fails to sufficiently fulfill its end of the bargain, its conditions under the contract, then it is the duty, obligation, and right of the people to rise up and overthrow that government. Okay? So within it, there is absolutely a clause endorsing revolution on the condition that the government has violated its terms of the contract. Okay? Uh, in, in other words, the government is in breach of contract. What he refers to it is when the government goes into breach of contract, the government it goes into rebellion against the contract. It will be the argument of the Americans, some of them anyways, the, the New Englanders for the most part, uh, that the government of England by the time of the American Revolution, by 1775, has gone into rebellion against the contract, okay? That the agreement that, that existed between England and America was fundamentally flawed, and therefore it was the right and the duty of the Americans to rise up against the English government. Uh, and, so, and so we have it built in, and that's one of the unique things about the Second Treatise, is it's built in government transition. After the revolution, as I said, Dominion of New England is abolished. Plymouth is absorbed into the Massachusetts colony. That's not entirely true. The northern part of the Plymouth colony was absorbed into New Hampshire. On to the first of the reorganizations. Now, we want to remember and kind of re recap uh, where we were at the end of the previous... Uh, slideshow. The English had just come out of a, uh, approximately seven decades of large-scale imperial wars with their European rivals, most notably France. Okay, This left England about 150 million pounds in debt. <coughs> in order to finance that debt, and, and one of the things the English are going to do as a result of this is a complete and radical reorganization of debt financing, which we can get into a little bit of detail because it's really interesting how they're going to do it. it. used to be that when the European powers would fight wars, okay, they would go into debt and then they would massively raise taxes after the war to pay the debt in one lump sum. The English aren't going to do that. First of all, they can't do that. 150 million pounds is way too much for them to be able to do. So instead, what they're going to do is they're going to restructure the debt. And for the first time in history, rather than paying the debt off, they're going to finance the debt, okay, with a certain percentage. They're going to sell the debt, okay, they're going to sell the debt in terms of bonds. And then those bonds will earn interest for the bondholders. The Americans will model this themselves after the American Revolution. And the principal bondholder will be uh, our famous, uh, 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 for whom our university is named, Robert Morris. But at any rate, we'll deal with that uh, in time when we get to it. And so, in order to pay this debt, now we want to understand that at the time, uh, this is now, let's, let's call this 1763. Okay, the end of the French and Indian War, the end of the Seven Years' War in Europe. At the time, the average English citizen in England is paying approximately 30% of their income in taxes to the, to the government. The Americans, by contrast, are paying less than 3% in taxes. Okay? Now, the English, in order to pursue the French and Indian War, and you'll remember, we'll just recap it really briefly, in the previous imperial wars, which is to say the War of the Grand Alliance, which was King William's War, uh, Queen Anne's War, and King George's War, the, 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 the North American theater was a sideshow. They didn't 
expend a lot of resources towards it. But in the French and Indian War, under the under the the suggestion of of William Pitt, they devoted considerable resources to pursuing it. The culmination of which was the Battle of Quebec and the Plains of Abraham, which drove the French from Canada. Okay, so it was very successful, but it left them in massive debt. So because they incurred a large cost as a result of defending and, and, and pursuing with vigor the conflict in the colonies, they wanted the colonies to pay for some of that. And it was going to be an ongoing thing. It was going to be an ongoing thing because the British now would have to keep uh, a military force in North America. What the, seven, what the uh, French and Indian War demonstrated was the significance of the North American colonies to Britain and how, and how important it was to maintain their defense. Well, that's going to cost money. And so they were originally come up with the American Revenue Act, which is simply stated, um, uh, sets the precedent condition for beginning to collect taxes from the American colonies. The first of the actual acts, okay, we have a few of them uh, that we've talked about before. We talked about uh, the Maryland Tobacco Inspection Act of 1747, in which they standardized the quality of tobacco, tobacco being used as the main credit system in, in the Chesapeake colonies, uh, and this established uh, a stability for the credit system. There was then the Currency Act in 1756 in Massachusetts, and as part of the American Revenue Act, the Currency Restriction Act, because if you recall uh, from our previous discussion, what Massachusetts had been doing, because, and there really gets to be a good bit of background, but I've already talked about it a little bit, because Massachusetts suffers from uh, miserably bad terms of trade, because they really don't have a cash crop to trade under the mercantile system of England, they're running into debt. So because they have very little specie to back that debt, they're over-issuing IOUs. Uh, and the Currency Restriction Act will restrict the number of IOUs that Massachusetts can use. Uh, what I was explaining to you last time about this was that what Massachusetts was doing, if you say they, they have one ounce of gold, they would issue a creditor, uh, an exporter from England, essentially, uh, an IOU for that one ounce of gold. They would then issue an IOU for the same ounce to another creditor on the probability that, that, that uh, at no point in time will both of these guys come to collect on that IOU. If they do both come to collect on that IOU, then they get screwed, and they, each of them only can get one half of the ounce of gold, and therefore they get 50% on the dollar. Okay? Similar thing is going to happen, we talk about in U.S. history too, with the bank runs on the U.S. banks beginning in the 1930s uh, in the Great Depression. But again, uh, we don't want to get too sidetracked with that, do we? We're back here in the 1760s. Let's, let's stay there for a little while. Okay. Uh, <coughs> but this had gotten completely out of hand in Massachusetts, where they were issuing nine or ten or eleven or twelve times uh, the, uh, the, the the amount of gold that they had, uh, and so English creditors, English exporters, were getting screwed left and right because of this. So they will restrict it and allow them to issue IOUs worth double the value of the amount of gold they have. So it was a two to one ratio figuring that you have a, a very high probability that at, at any point in time both of them won't come to collect. And as I mentioned to you, the banking system currently in the U.S. is based on this with the reserve requirement. Banks are uh, uh, obliged by law in the United States to keep a certain percentage of their deposits on reserve at the Federal Reserve Bank, that, that uh, ratio being right about 20% give or take, sometimes less, sometimes more, uh, because the idea is that it, it, it uh, there's a probability model of how many of your depositors at any one given point in time will come to demand their deposits. Um, okay, so with the currency acts, it systematizes currency in the colonies uh, and grants Britain greater control over the currency in the colonies. So again, this is another of these I mentioned to you at the very beginning in the introductory video, the idea of trend analysis. This is another individual instance. In fact, on this slide we see three individual instances of Great Britain attempting to exert greater control over its colonies. In this case, uh, greater control over colonial economics antecedent to 
the economic reorganization and the attempt by England to exert greater control over colonial economics that we just talked about, there was a political reorganization as well, uh, which will attempt to get, exert greater control over the colonies by England on a political basis. And remember how we define the difference. Economics is the control over resources. Politics is the control over behavior. The first thing they'll do is after uh, uh, the Seven Years' War, England will gain control over northern Florida, east and west Florida. Uh, they'll break it into east and west Florida. And rather than having assemblies elected uh, and governors elected by the people and by the assemblies, in the, the British crown will simply appoint governors in east and west Florida. And they'll be essentially established as military districts. Um, the most egregious of them are the next three, however, that we want to go over. First was the proclamation line. The proclamation line prevented, it prohibited the colonies from expanding further west. Okay, there was a demarcation line largely at the Piedmont region, the western end of the Piedmont region, which is to say west of the Alleghenies. So in the area of Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, and, and western Georgia, the colonies were prohibited from going any further west. The idea of, on the British part being that, remember that after the French and Indian War, the French maintain control of the Louisiana Territory west of the Mississippi by issuing the Proclamation Act and preventing colonial spread further west the English were effectively creating a demilitarized zone between the French held territory west of the Mississippi and their colonies east of the Mississippi okay by establishing a demilitarized zone, this will greatly reduce the stress placed on British resources and the British Army in North America. Uh, it's similar, I suppose, in one of the differences, and I don't know if any of you guys follow Canadian football. I used to way years ago. But one of the differences between American football and Canadian football is in American football, the line of scrimmage, the offense and defensive lines are nose to nose. In Canadian football, they're not. In Canadian football, the defense has to stay one yard off the ball. Um, uh, same basic idea, uh, which is going to upset the colonists to no end. And there's a problem with it as well, because as I've said, for reasons that we talked about in the first lecture, the colonial organization economically was such that it was inherently expansionistic. To soak up the labor and to soak up the increases in population, they continually needed to expand their land holdings, which is what led to the difficulties with the native populations. Okay, This will prevent that from happening, and in so doing, will also prevent the expansion of their populations and the expansion of their economic production. Okay. So that's one, the Proclamation Act. That's one of the first things that's a real egregious offense to the colonies. The second is the establishment of a standing army in the colonies. This is problematic. Prior to this time, there were no standing armies. And we'll get into the philosophical basis of the revolution in just a minute here. But there is a general difficulty. Republican ideology is generally opposed to a standing army. Armies prior to this time, uh, were assembled to deal with a particular security issue. In other words, if the nation goes to war, they conscript an army at the time, and then train it, and then go to war. They don't keep a standing army. Because there's a problem with a standing army. <clears throat> if you have all these soldiers lying about doing nothing, in other words, when the army's not at war, what do they do? Okay? The, the fear is that, for the most part, they'll prey on their own civilian population. The difficulty that the colonies are going to, to have, ultimately, which will be one of the precipitatory causes of, of the Boston Massacre and the difficulties in Boston, is that to, what, what the soldiers will do, and America, the American military does this to some degree, okay? The American military will do this to some degree. 
in an effort to make more money, the soldiers will get jobs. Okay, they'll get second jobs. Okay, in addition to being a member of the British Army, they'll get a second job. They'll do this in the American military. There are soldiers that do this in the American military. In addition to their duties to the military, they'll go and get a part-time job. My stepdaughter did this. Okay, when her duties had gone down and she'd gone back to college, she got a job one winter to make more money at Victoria's Secret during the Christmas season. Okay, same thing's going to happen with the British Army. Well, the problem is the jobs that they take are jobs that could be filled by Americans, and so unemployment will begin to rise, and the standing British Army will be held accountable for this. Uh, and then finally uh, is the Quartering Act, and this is going to become a point of contention again, especially by New York. The Quartering Act stipulates the exact opposite of the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The Second Amendment con uh, to the U.S. Constitution is usually the only part of the Second Amendment that anybody ever pays any attention to is the people's right to keep and bear arms. There's another part to that Second Amendment. Okay, Under the Second Amendment, Congress is prohibited from passing laws that force American citizens to house soldiers uh, during times of peace. Now, Congress can, in fact, pass laws that force American citizens currently. Congress can pass laws that force American citizens to house soldiers during a time of war, if war is declared. Okay? What the Quartering Act is going to do is force the colonists to house and quarter uh, the standing army that England is going to have in the Americas at their expense, at the, at the col colonists' expense, uh, which is going to be another uh, contentious issue. In addition to these, and on, again on a political level, there's going to be a couple of incidents that uh, the English are going to attempt to exert greater control over colonial assemblies, okay? The two big ones you see listed here are what are what's referred to as the Parsons Cause and the threat to the New York Assembly. Now, with the Parsons Cause, just to kind of explain it in brief, uh, the clergy in Virginia, and this is in Virginia, so this will be with the House of Burgesses, the clergy in Virginia was paid in tobacco. Okay, tobacco, as I've mentioned before, was really the basis of the economies in the Chesapeake region. Uh, and so they were paid in tobacco, and it was a standardized fee uh, of two pennies per pound. Okay, and so they would be paid in tobacco, and the tobacco would be valued at two pennies a pound. So that was the basis of their salary. Well, the problem is that at the time, tobacco was going for six pennies a pound. So the, the clergy, the Parsons, were being underpaid, and England instigates, England inspires, okay, the Parsons to sue the Virginian legislature, the House of Burgesses, for back pay, to make up for the fact that they were being underpaid, uh, <coughs> which will have a tremendous reaction uh, from the, the House of Burgesses. Now, regardless of the particulars, Okay, the kind of constitutional question here is whether or not England has the right to dictate what assemblies can and cannot do. Okay, the House of Burgesses, uh, according to them, is an independent legislature. They are not under the control of England, and so they are free to pass such laws as they see fit to govern the colony of Virginia. England says, no, 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 you are a royal crown colony, meaning that while you have an assembly, that assembly is ultimately under the control of the king, and therefore the king can enact such legislation as he sees fit, or his agency, meaning parliament, can pass such laws as it sees fit. And so it moves to bumping up the pay of the Parsons and making it equal. Patrick Henry will be, the very famous patriot Patrick Henry, will defend the Virginia Assembly, okay, and, and be the first to, to, to discuss the idea of this is a tyrannical expansion of British control. The British have never attempted to control the legislature before, okay.
It's up to us to settle this dispute with the Parsons, not up to the British. And they will, in fact, settle the dispute with them uh, favorably. Well, it's kind of a negotiated settlement there. They'll increase the pay. They'll pass the Two Penny Act, uh, and it will increase the pay uh, of, of the Parsons. The second of these is the threat to the New York Assembly. For, uh, and it's a very similar argument. The New York Assembly perceives itself to be an independent assembly. Okay, and so when the Quartering Act is passed, the New York Assembly passes legislation that refuses to abide by it. In other words, they say that the state of New York is going to opt out of the Quartering Act. The Crown, England, says, no, 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 you can't do that. You are, like Virginia, a royal crown colony established after the Second Anglo-Dutch War. Therefore, while you have an assembly, that assembly is under the direct control of Parliament and the King. Okay? <clears throat> and on the second level, it establishes the idea that what we're, what we're dealing with is a philosophical constitutional crisis. Whose sovereignty is Trump? The colonies see themselves as only nominally under the control of England. They see themselves as independent sovereign interests. England contends, no, 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 you are under the control of the king and of parliament, and so you do not have the right to nullify royal law, laws passed by parliament. You are subject to them because you are British citizens. Okay? Uh, this will overall represent an expansion of royal authority. Okay? The, the crown will claim the right to enact laws in the colonies, to veto laws in the colonies, and ultimately to come up with writs of assistance, which will, in, and this will be the, the, what I spoke of earlier, which will be enforcement of the acts of trade mostly the Navigation Acts. They will begin progressively even more now. Beginning in the 1690s, they really start to. But now, it's going to become institutionalized, the enforcement of the Navigation Acts and the other acts of trade. Okay, All of this demonstrates an attempt by England to exert greater control over both economics and politics in the colonies. The reaction to this will be the Stamp Act Congress. Now, I mentioned real briefly, and I'll go over it in more detail now, the idea of the Stamp Act. Okay? What the Stamp Act, the Stamp Act was the first real attempt to collect taxes from the colonies. And in, in a modern context, in modern terminology, the Stamp Act was effectively a sales tax. What the British did was they would place a stamp on certain items, okay? Tea, for example, playing cards, a whole series of items that we don't need to get into the list. Uh, if I was a really mean person, I'd make you memorize the list of enumerated products under the Stamp Act. That would be a horribly mean thing to do, uh, and an entirely pointless thing to do, uh, and utterly trivial, which is why I don't do that. But there are a number of products, okay? We have that today. We have that today. There are stamps. For example, in, in the United States, there are stamps on a pack of cigarettes. Okay? Uh, this is uh, the, the idea of the Stamp Act. Anything with that stamp is subject to a tax. All right? On top of the other things that we've talked about, the Proclamation Act, the Quartering Act, the presence of a standing army, the interventions against the legislatures in, in Virginia and New York, uh, this creates a host of grievances on the part of the colonists, okay? And so this will be the first colonial reaction against Britain. And what we're now going to watch is, is, from this point forward, is a kind of a, almost a chess match where we have move and counter move on both players' part, okay? So in the one sense, we have the British enacting these economic and political reorganizations to gain greater control over the colonies. Okay? We've already seen a small reaction on the part of the colonists, which the New York with, with the New York legislature threatening not to go along with the Quartering Act, and the House of Burgesses objecting to 
uh, uh, royal intervention in the dispute they have with their clergy. Okay, now we're going to see it in a little bit more full force. In in direct reaction to the Stamp Act uh, passed in '64, will be the Stamp in, passed in '65 rather will be the Stamp Act Congress, which assembles in 1765. They will, among other things, write what will become the forerunner of the Declaration of Independence, which is the Declaration of Rights and Grievances, which puts down on paper their grievances against England, against the government, against the king. Uh, and will really, what we were talking, what I was talking about just a little while ago, in terms of uh, uh, John Locke and the Second Treatise of Government and the Right of Revolution, this will establish the just cause. What the colonists are claiming, they're beginning to claim here, is that the government in England, Parliament and the King, are in breach of contract. The contract, as the colonists understand it, the contract is that the colonies are to be nominally under the control of Britain, but are for the most part independent actors and are given independent governance. Okay, The reorganization by the English that we've just talked about contradicts that. Okay. So, in pursuit of this objection, they will create the non-importation movement that, that attempts to get Americans to stop importing uh, British goods. It will be a forerunner of the first large boycott. Okay? Now, the, there's a problem with this. Okay? Based on the mercantile system that we talked about previously in, I think, the first lecture, the Americans sell to the British primary products, low-value-added primary products, and in exchange, the British sell higher-value-added manufactured goods. So all of the manufactured goods coming into the colonies <coughs> are coming from Great Britain. Okay, and we looked at that one, if I recall correctly from that slide, 80% of everything, all manufactured goods in the colonies, were from Britain. So if you're not going to import these things, where are you going to get your manufactured goods? The answer is you're not going to get them. And so there's difficulty getting the colonists to go along with this non-importation movement. In an effort to get them to go along with it, Samuel Adams will create an organization known as the Sons of Liberty. And by every stretch of the imagination, by every definition of the term, the Sons of Liberty are a terrorist organization. Okay, because what they will do is they will force, through intimidation and violence, American colonists to go along with the non importation boycott. And so, colonial importers of British goods will literally have their establishments burned out by the Sons of Liberty, they will be beaten up by the Sons of Liberty. This is they will be tarred and feathered. Okay. Later on, and by later on I mean a year later, those English agents collecting the stamp tax and later on the Townsend duties will actually be tarred and feathered, okay? Which is to say they'll be covered in hot tar and then feathered. Thrown, feathers will be thrown on them, okay? This is the Sons of Liberty. The Sons of Liberty will ultimately, their penultimate achievement, will be the organization of... Uh, the Boston, the very famous Boston Tea Party. So things are heating up. 